welcome to this podcast series on food authenticity. My name is Will Souter. In this episode, we're talking about wine. Our guest is Gordon Burns, the technical director and co-founder of ETS Laboratories, which runs specialist wine analysis labs based in the Napa Valley in California. The North American wine industry has quite a different story to tell than honey when it comes to authenticity issues. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Gordon, who can tell us all about it. Hi, Gordon. How are you doing today? I'm fine. I'm fine, Will. Thanks for asking. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you today. Yeah, pleasure to talk to you too. So to start off with, can you introduce yourself and your business and talk about uh, a bit of background on ETS Labs? Yeah, absolutely. ETS Laboratories is a uh, family-owned business. My wife and I started it some 42 years ago right here in St. Helena, not more than a half a mile from where I sit today. Um, though it's not in the same space, we, are, we still have our roots here in the middle of the Napa Valley in California and right in the heart, of course, of the one of the premium wine growing regions of the United States. We're an independent laboratory, truly independent. Around the world, there are a lot of laboratories that uh, work with wine who are in one way or another branches of government labs or, or supported by trade associations. Not true for us. Our income is entirely what our clients decide is worthwhile to them and that they choose to come back to us for again and again. I guess we've been successful enough at that since we still have clients with us now that have been with us for those 42 years since the very beginning. And of course, many thousands of others, including today, uh, quite a, a global contingent because we do offer some analyses that are not available anywhere else in the world. We do everything for wineries, uh, starting with the grapes in the vineyard, uh, right through the harvest, right through the fermentation process, and up to and including the wine after it's been in bottle for as much as 50 years. So it's entirely focused on winemaking. I can't tell you we don't do a little bit for other alcoholic beverages, but if it doesn't have alcohol and you don't drink it, we don't do it. So that means we don't do vineyard work, for example, on the front end of this chain, uh, but everything else. Over the years, we've we've watched the demands from our from our clients evolve a lot. It began in the early days with something as simple as, could you please tell me the acidity, the sugar, and what's in my in my berries? And now um, it's evolved to where we have a quite considerable staff to help address the needs of our clients here in our main St. Helena laboratory. On any given day, you'll find more than 30 people uh, working and doing analysis, plus, of course, the other 20 or so people that exist to help support that function. In addition to that, up and down the west coast of the United States, we have uh, remote laboratories. We, we call them satellite labs. And they range from Eastern Washington and a really beautiful wine growing region there to the also beautiful Willamette Valley of Oregon, where they grow a lot of Burgundy style varieties to the Sonoma Valley, which is quite near here, but a distinct wine growing region and down south to what we call the Central Coast in Paso Robles, which is a phenomenal wine growing region with increasing demands. So in each of these locations, we have smaller laboratories that um, exist on our same quality system using the same methodologies as we do here, but they have a, a shorter scope of work. Here in St. Helena, things have evolved where we, to the point that we have almost every sophisticated analytical technology that can come to play in the analysis of wine. And that ranges on the, on the simpler side from things such as titrations for titratable acidity, pH, very important sulfur dioxide with highly automated equipment, adapted clinical equipment that does uh, routine analyses such as the organic acids in wine and sugars, right up through a whole range of other things to include chromatographic techniques such as LC-MS-MS and gc MSMS, including accurate mass. So everything exists for its own purpose, 
and we we hope to be ready to serve our our clients' needs. So you've spoken before about winemaking being uh, a combination of science and art. Uh, can you speak about how your role on the scientific side with the ETS laboratories uh, plays into that whole process? And how have more uh, scientific methods and technologies been welcomed in the industry? Right. Well, let, let me repeat that, that simple uh, phrase that many of the listeners will have heard, but one can make wine with all art and no science. One can make wine with all science and no art, but the best wine involves a combination of those two things. So yes, we, we hope that we satisfy the science side of that equation by delivering the data that clients need to help support their, their artistic efforts on the winemaking side. I like the word craft better. Winemaking is a craft whether it's done on a very small scale or it's done on an enormous scale, still it's a craft. People doing magic, taking those grapes from the vineyard and turning them into something that can endure and even improve in the, in the bottle over a period of decades. Uh, so uh, you've also been a champion for uh, newer techniques, like, you know, as well as all the uh, sort of more traditional analyses and the uh, sort of more straightforward chemical analyses that you were talking about. Um, you've also been a champion for new techniques like NMR. Uh, what does that bring to your kind of toolkit that you don't get from the other techniques? Right. Well, I, I hope I hope we're, we're a little bit careful in selecting new techniques. Uh, we try not to just jump because a new technique is available, but rather to, to investigate what benefit it brings to our clients or could bring to our clients. Often, though, uh, as we embrace new technologies, uh, we are on what folks call the bleeding edge, which means that we are the people who have to take the technology and adapt it to the winemaking field. It's been interesting over the years to watch uh, scores and scores of folks, very well-meaning and brilliant, some of them with new technologies coming to us and saying, well, I have something very special and I'm sure it will be useful in the winemaking field only to be defeated once they understand the complexity of winemaking and of wine itself. Wine is an extraordinarily complex uh, foodstuff with thousands of components that can be analyzed from any given wine uh, using a, a combination of techniques. Our adoption of NMR has been somewhat different in that we partnered with Bruker, the world's largest producer of, of NMR, to take work that they've done over the past decade or so in the field of winemaking and to extend it to the United States. So Bruker has built a platform, a software platform on top of the, the NMR hardware technology that is called Wine Screener. And it uses the NMR spectrum that's obtained and then a very sophisticated adaptation of chemometrics to answer questions such as what variety is the predominant variety in this bottle? What is the likely origin of this wine geographically? And even in some cases, what vintage is this wine? So this can only be done with a database of authentic samples that are known to be authentic as to those attributes I just talked about. Once again, what variety is it? Where did it come from? And when was it grown? So this database does not yet exist for the United States. And that's our side of the partnership with Bruker is that we're working and have been working um, diligently to obtain those authentic samples to obtain the spectra that relate to them and that high level metadata, as we call it, of what the samples are for Bruker then to incorporate into their chemometric models. Once this effort, this collaborative effort is completed, it will be over a, a gradual period of some years, then we will be able to answer those same questions about wines that are grown here in the United States. For your clients, for winemakers, what demands do they see from their consumers? And 
Is that something that's evolving, that's changed in sort of recent years, or is it something that's fairly consistent? We hear consistently and increasingly from our clients that they're con- the consumers that they're working with are demanding to know more about the provenance of the wine that's in the bottle that they're selling to them. They're demanding to know more about proof of where it was grown and what the varietal is. And this is not unique, as I said, to to wine. It's happening right across the food supply chain. For this reason, people are coming to us and saying, well, I need to establish this. What techniques do you have in place that can help me with that? We have many techniques that we've applied over the years to help answer these questions. NMR is an additional technique that brings huge value to the table. Why is that? Well, NMR in this application has the ability, which is unique among our other analytical techniques, to look at a very broad range of compounds that are within the wine simultaneously in one analytical run, as we call it. NMR doesn't care whether the compound that it's looking at is an acid or a base, whether it's a phenolic compound or something else, whether it's an alcohol or a phenolic, it doesn't care. So we can obtain a very, very broad spectrum of NMR responses that looks at the entire composition of the wine in one go. Um, This is fantastic because to do something similar using other analytical techniques, we might need to employ HPLC with various kinds of detection with multiple runs, coupled with gas chromatography and various kinds of detection in multiple runs, along with all of the basic chemistries. So with that one run, the NMR spectra gets at a very, very large selection of the major constituents, and it has been established that that's adequate with the proper chemometrics and the proper database underlying it to help predict the origin, the varietal, and even, as I said, in some cases, the vintage. Is it the be-all and end-all? And the answer, in my view, is no. Uh, but as, as a first step, and in some cases as the only step, this NMR prediction will allow us to find wines that might have some question as to whether they meet the standard that they're asked to adhere to. And then we might bring into play many of these other analytical techniques that I mentioned a few minutes ago uh, to help verify and, and further establish the conclusions. So those that sort of pressure to adhere to those standards, is that coming entirely from consumers or do uh, regulatory bodies play into that as well? Are there, are there increasing demands uh, from a sort of legal or legislative standpoint for the product to meet? Well, in the United States, at least to date, we don't have the regulatory pressure. Um, I would see that that's something that will come down the road and it will be very good to be in advance of such requirements by having the the technology and the database in place. More it's coming, when I say it's consumer pressure, more it's coming from producers themselves, producers who say, it's my duty to establish the these basic facts regarding the wines that I'm providing to consumers. Uh, it's my duty to have this proof in place And by having it in place, I strengthen my brand. I strengthen my brand. I strengthen my um, validity in the eyes of the consumers. I believe the main factor driving it is the producers themselves, once again, wanting to establish the authenticity and the origin and being able to demonstrate that as underlying the value of their of their product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. So how do trade associations play into that as well? You know, associations between producers or other players in the industry. And, you know, does that, does that vary region to region? Right. Absolutely. Um, Here in the United States, there's, there's one major trade association and two or three others that are also important 
that uh, that represent uh, wineries and wine growers throughout the country. These these associations also see it as part of their duty, part of their mandate, if you will, to strengthen the brand that is, for example, wine California or wine Oregon. Uh, and in that and in that vein, they are exhibiting a very strong desire to incorporate this kind of technology that we've been discussing for those same reasons that I just discussed to establish the authenticity, the provenance, and secure that chain of the authenticity right from the vineyard to the consumer. Yeah, that's interesting. In, in previous episodes, I've been talking to uh, people from the honey industry in North America, and uh, they have quite a different uh, sort of experience with their trade associations who are... Uh, doing the opposite of trying to enforce standards with better technologies and you know better testing um so even though some of the producers are keen and the consumers are keen it's you know the the trade associations and the other larger bodies in between are something of a an obstacle to that so uh yeah it's interesting that the wine industry is sort of setting a better example it's not my field of course but if i if i could predict Mm -hmm. having spoken to a number of people in, in that field I think that will change. It simply has to change once they recognize the the importance and once they recognize that securing the supply chain is not not optional. It's mandatory in this day and age. And being able to demonstrate that unbroken link right through to the consumer is going to be not something that they get to choose. It's going to be something that they will be asked to establish. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly the hope. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's good to see the wine industry sort of setting a better example and that, <laughs> that hopefully other industries can follow. So do consumers need to worry about adulteration of wine? You know, how common uh, is that in practice? I, I can speak largely to the United States and tell you that within the United States, there is very little adulteration that goes on because after all, it doesn't make for a sustainable business to engage in those practices. The producers that we deal with and have dealt with now for over 42 years are upstanding, honorable people. And I truly don't believe that the issue of adulteration is something that consumers need to worry about coming from these, from these people. Having said that, in the trade of wine, in the global trade of wine, when wines start being shipped from one country to another, when they go through multiple hands, through brokers to intermediaries to the hands of people handling the shipment, there is always the possibility of something going awry. Um, There are possibilities of things going awry, not because of intentional intentional, uh, misdeeds, let us say, uh, but even just from honest errors and things that can happen out there in the real world. So is it, is there no adulteration in the wine industry worldwide? No, I couldn't say that with a straight face. And uh, certainly there, it, it has happened and no doubt it will happen again, but whether or not this is widespread, it doesn't change the basic fact that we've talked about over the past few minutes here on our call today will that the duty to establish that continuous chain and to be able to to prove the authenticity is not lessened. We're going to take a quick break again now to talk about Food Screener. So Gordon has already brilliantly explained the power of NMR spectroscopy and how he uses it in his lab. If you think Food Screener might be able to help you ensure and verify the authenticity of your food products, do reach out to Bruker's experts at bruker.com slash foodscreener. They'll be very happy to talk with you. And there are also plenty of resources available there if you just want to learn more about this technology. Now, let's get back to the interview with Gordon. He's going to tell us about how using Food Screener helps him create assurance for his clients all the way down their supply chains. He talked about you know, ETS, your sort of role 
comes in at various points through the winemaking process. Do you think there's, uh, if people did need more sort of assurance, particularly, you know, if you, people are buying Californian wines in Asia or something where you've got, you know, really long chains of exporters and importers and distributors and retailers, do you think more testing at each point down that chain? So, you know, to be able to sort of re-verify the certification that yes, this particular vintage and variety is correct. Do you think that's something that, that may come in in the future? Well, absolutely. Maybe it's a good time to talk about uh, other applications of the NMR uh, beyond beyond just the uh, what's referred to as the wine screener application. The next one in that chain that's extremely important is the use of NMR to answer the question of whether wine A is the same as wine B. And that gets to your to your question, Will. So absolutely, we've had, uh, even today, we've had multiple instances of, of wine producers saying, look, there's this product in the marketplace that's claiming to be our product, um, in, and this is in a foreign country. Many of them in Asia, but not entirely. And and we uh, we we believe we almost certainly know that it's not the same product that we shipped out of our winery can you establish that for us with, with objective analytical data in addition to what we know and nmr is a perfect tool for that once again uh, we have other tools that are in our in our quiver in our repertoire that we could use to help do this but nmr has that Ability that I'll repeat of looking at hundreds of constituents of the wine in one go, and then looking at that at that spectra comparative to a second wine, and answering the question with very high assurance of is this wine the same wine as the other? There's yet another that I think is I think is fantastic about NMR, and this relates not to the authenticity, the, uh, the securing the supply chain, or is this wine the same as the other? But and often NMR is not thought of as a as a quantitative analytical tool. It's often thought of as a qualitative analytical tool. Those who were listening to this call who experienced NMR in college were probably given some some compound and said, okay, your, your experiment is to tell me what is this compound and show me its molecular structure based upon NMR. Well, fantastic. NMR is great for that. But NMR also has the ability to do quantitative analysis of compounds. And this, this quantitation can be done even on compounds for which an authentic reference standard is not available. There's no other technique that I know of that that can make that claim. So we've had we've had opportunity to have requests for some unique analytical measurement where we simply were not able to procure or to synthesize the analytical standard where we've been able to build a quantitative analytical measurement using NMR for that compound to the delight of our clients who needed that that information to answer some kind of a winemaking question. I anticipate that NMR will increasingly be used in this application as a quantitative analytical instrument uh, out in the laboratories. And we look forward to using it in that, in that application as well. Yeah, that's fascinating. Now you've said it, that's an obvious application that, <laughs> that makes it another thing that makes it stand out. Um, and I guess both of those applications that you talked about um, uh, benefit from uh, not necessarily needing a, a database to compare against from the sound of it, right? So if you're comparing two wines at the beginning and end of, of a distribution chain or you know, anything like that, you just need those two samples and that's it. So it sounds like that could be uh, potentially a, make the sort of scaling of the, of the sort of application of the technique a little bit easier than for the tell me what vintage this is question um, because you don't need to have that database built up ahead of time. You no, know, no, it's exactly right. And an application that uh, 
well, I can't say it didn't occur to us, but that clients are coming to us and saying, well, gosh, here's what it's really good for today. Absent having that U.S. database completed, here's what I'm going to do, they tell me. You know, I go to, I go to some country. I won't name one, lest we <laughs> impugn somebody. I go to some country uh, overseas and I visit the vineyard. I visit the producer. I sit and I have a lovely dinner with them. They become my best friends. We taste wines. I shake hands and I say, okay, yes, I'd like however many thousands of gallons of, uh, of, this, of this product. And then the next thing that happens and or has happened historically is that a tanker shows up you know, at their, at their winery or it's either it's bottled or it shows up in a tanker for bottling here or for blending. And they, uh, and out comes the wine. And in some cases it has happened that that wine doesn't reflect what they think they bought in the first place for whatever reason. And, and once again, I'll emphasize it doesn't mean that fraud needed to have been committed. Any number of, any number of things could have happened along that chain. So, uh, people have changed their ways and they say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have well taken samples taken at the point that I buy the wine. I'm going to have one of those samples set directly to you, Gordon, at, at ETS. And I'm going to ask you to obtain an NMR spectra of that wine and save it away as a signature of that, of that wine. Then I'm going to pull additional samples as it's loaded into the tanker, let's say, as it's loaded onto the ship, and then you could get as granular as you wish. You know, as it's offloaded from the ship, who knows what could happen on the high seas and in multiple ports. And I'll have another sample as it's received at the winery. And either they send us each of those samples for comparison along the chain, or we look at the front end and the back end of that process. And then when, when and if there were to be a mismatch, let's say, then they're able to drill back into that collection of samples and see where something might have gone astray. What an obvious application of a technique like this for not very much money, certainly relative to the typical value of a wine transaction. And that's, yes, that's in play today. I see that as being one of the major, major applications of the technique. Yeah, fascinating. So let's just dig back to that the database point again. Could you talk about that process of building up the database of, of US wines for the for the wine screener? You know, that's something you've been involved with. What are some of the sort of, uh, I guess, some of the achievements and some of the challenges? Yes, absolutely. Well, first we need to have a good view of the wines that represent wine in commerce within the United States. For that reason, we're working hand in hand with uh, with others. I will just say who have access to that to that detailed information, so as to be able to give us the uh, the hit list, if you will, of which varieties from which regions and how many of those we need to have in order to truly represent well um, the, the thing that is wine and commerce within the United States. Well, that's, that's in place. And then the next step is, of course, a logistical issue, which is to then obtain all those wines. And these need to be wines, of course, that are authentic 100% of the variety we're talking about uh, from a known, well-characterized region and they need to be single year, of course, not blended. So some planning is required on the part of producers because wines are not always kept as single varietals uh, are in that state that we need them for the analysis. So how are we doing on this? Pretty well. We were doing pretty well. We're some hundreds of samples into this, uh, into this database, but we need to be thousands of samples into it for it to be fully usable. And I'll say we've We've lost uh, about a year, as everyone on this listening to this podcast might guess the why of it all. You will guess about the virus issues, the terrible virus issues that simply disrupt normal operations of everything. 
and the ability for wineries to practically go pull these samples has been disrupted. But then uh, everyone may not recognize that uh, we are geographically, we're in the beautiful Napa Valley, but we just experienced on top of the COVID mess, um, some horrendous wildfires this year. Um, these wildfires came down both sides of the valley to within literally hundreds of yards of the, the town of St. Helena, where our main laboratory is located. Many, many, many scores of people lost their homes, and it's been devastating for the region as a whole. So the collection of these samples and consequently the building of the database has been on hold, but we're, we're now re-engaging in that process. We, all of us, hope that 2021 will be a smoother year than 2020 from the COVID perspective. And we also here hope that though we know that wildfires are just a thing that we're going to have to live with moving forward, we certainly hope they won't be as widespread and devastating as they as they were in 2020. But yeah, the, the challenges challenges in short are, are having access to uh, the list of what we actually need to obtain for the database to be meaningful. The next one is the logistics of obtaining those in the form that we need as single varietals. Um, and the uh, actual analysis of the wines and the generation of the chemometrics, less of an issue. Yeah, I guess that's trivial once you solve the first two points. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, in general, then, where do you see uh, the future of the wine industry in the coming years? Are there any changes that you see coming? Any impacts from you know, COVID or from you know, climate and wildfire that you might see? And uh, how do you see sort of your role as an analyst in, in the industry and, uh, and the growing use of NMR as well? How do you see that playing into all of that? Yeah, you bet. Well, I see the wine industry continuing to grow globally. There have been challenges globally. There are many uh, that have the wine industry has had to face. But at the same time, uh, wine consumption globally uh, is remaining steady and even climbing in many market segments. I see the, the future of the California wine industry to be especially bright. There is a lot of innovation occurring in the California industry. New varietals are being planted in locations that they weren't planted previously in response to issues of climate change. So all is not over. Things simply change. Uh, varietals that um, were not previously viable in regions up and down the West Coast of the United States have now become viable. Consumer trends uh, favor premium wines and we certainly work with every segment of the industry, but premium wines are a, a significant part of what we do. So that's positive for the industry as a whole and for ETS. I believe that we will continue to see innovations in analytical technology. I believe many of those will be on the chromatography side, leading to uh, more rapid analyses and hopefully more rugged instrumentation right across the board. NMR is going to have an important role to play in all of that for those reasons that I stated before. They include the important use of the Bruker implementation of wine screener for variety, origin, and even in some cases vintage. It's going to become important in the wine industry increasingly for that question of is wine A the same as wine B, which extends to securing the supply chain a lot by saying, how have we protected the authenticity of this wine right through the chain? And I believe that the application of NMR as a quantitative tool is going to explode. We will see many, many, many more applications of the technique for that. There are limitations to NMR. So does it replace the LC triple quad MS or the GC triple quad MS or accurate mass, mass spec? No, it doesn't replace them. At least the way we use the instrumentation, it's a technique for part per million analysis on the lower end. It's not a technique for part per trillion analysis, which we do a lot of for other reasons. 
using other analytical techniques. So the right technique for the right job. But in its role, it's filled a gap. And I think it's going to be solidly important for the future of analytical techniques in winemaking. Excellent. Yeah, that was all really fascinating. So yeah, thank you so much for uh, yeah sharing your insights and uh, talking with me today. Okay, you're welcome, Will. A big thank you to Gordon for sharing his expertise with us there. I found that conversation really fascinating and I hope you did too. In the next episode of this podcast, we're going to return to the world of honey. If you've seen episodes one and two of this podcast, you'll be familiar with our guests, Ron Phipps and Professor Michael Roberts. They each gave us a great solo presentation, which I hope you'll check out if you haven't already, in addition to my conversation with them in episode five. In the meantime, don't forget there is lots more material about the food screener available on Bruker's website if you want to learn more about it. And of course, you can reach out to Bruker's experts as well. Just go to bruker.com slash food screener. Thanks for listening. Thank you.